Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopez, and today I'm here with Dr. Keith Frankish. He is a British philosopher and writer currently living in Crete, Greece. He's an honorary reader at the University of Sheffield, a visiting research fellow with the Open University, and an adjunct professor with the Brain and Mind program at the University of Crete. He works mainly in philosophy of mind, also with interests in other areas of philosophy. And he's also the author of books like Mind and Supermind, Cognitive Unconscious and Human Rationality, and Illusionism as a Theory of Consciousness. So, Dr. Frankish, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you for inviting me, Ricardo. It's oh, a delight. It's, <laughs> it's my pleasure. Okay, so since today we're going to talk about consciousness, I guess that perhaps we could start off by defining what is consciousness, because I guess that when people even use the term, perhaps different people mean different things, right? Absolutely. Um, that's, uh, it's, it's the obvious question to ask at the beginning, but it's not such a simple question. Um, it's consciousness is something that we all seem to to know very well, perhaps better than anything else. But as soon as you start to to try to define it, things get a little bit a bit complicated. And um, certainly, you find there are different different things that you could mean by the term. Uh, well, look, let's just start with a very simple use of the term. Uh, consciousness, I suppose, the core meaning is something like aware awareness. Okay, so. One everyday use of the term that we have that isn't really uh, doesn't raise too many, too many philosophical problems is uh, just sort of being awake and aware of things in the normal way. So if you've been anaesthetized for an operation and you you come around, then you uh, regain consciousness. Uh, you become a, aware of things around you in the normal way, and you start responding to them normally. Yes, but but that's interesting because there's a slight difference, at least, between awareness and consciousness, or, or not. Well, so far that term doesn't. Um, that these are other senses of consciousness that we can we can move on to. This is some what I was talking about there—the sense of being awake and responding normally. That's mm -hmm. sometimes referred to as creature consciousness because it's the creature that is conscious or not conscious. And I think in that sense, there isn't too much of a difficulty in applying the term to, say, to non-human animals. If a dog has been anesthetized, you can say it's come around, it's regained consciousness. And you're not there building in any strong claims about what is involved in this. You can see that it's regained consciousness because it's awake and running around and wagging its tail. And you know. So that's not too problematic. Another use that isn't too, um, too, too, doesn't raise too many problems is to use consciousness, uh, to speak of somebody being conscious of something. So you might be conscious that someone is, is watching you, or conscious of a face at the window. And again, that just means aware of. You're aware of the face. You're aware that someone's watching you. And that's the use, I suppose, when we talk about self-consciousness. You're aware of yourself. I'm self-conscious in, in, in giving a speech or something. I'm very, very aware of myself and what I'm doing. And I suppose when we talk about class consciousness, you're aware of yourself as a member of a certain socioeconomic group. So again, that's that's sometimes called transitive consciousness. It's awareness of something. Now, as I say, those, there's, of course, there's an awful lot of, of um, interesting questions about what's involved in that kind of awareness. But in itself, that's not, that doesn't raise too many problems. When we get into, when we get into the more tricky things, tricky areas, is when we talk about mental states being conscious or not conscious. Mental states, beliefs, desires, emotions, fears, this sort of thing. And we can talk about a mental state being conscious or not conscious. Now, again, the different things we might mean. One thing that we, um, that we might mean is that we're not aware of having the state. We're not, if a non-conscious desire is one that I'm not aware of having, just in the way that if I'm not conscious of the face at the window, I'm not aware of it, I'm not conscious of the desire, I'm not aware of it. And this, I suppose, Freud popularized this idea, the idea that we have lots of mental states, lots of fears and desires and things that we're not aware of having. And he thought that 
trying to bring these into consciousness, making ourselves aware of them, would have a therapeutic value. He thought that we were not aware of them because they'd been kind of repressed in some way. Now, modern, I mean, set aside what you think about Freud, some people, uh, no, opinions differ, but modern cognitive psychology recognizes a, a whole uh, raft of mental states that are unconscious in this sense. Not ones that have been repressed, not ones that are traumatic or anything like that, but just operating under the surface, kind of taking care of the routine business of getting you around the world and interacting with each other. Okay. Uh, and this is sometimes referred to as the, the cognitive unconscious. And again, we can talk about these states. Normally they operate, as it were, under the radar. You might not even be aware that you have, that you have them, that they're there at all. Uh, uh, but sometimes you might, they might come into consciousness, as it were. Mm -hmm. And again, this isn't too problematic. We're just talking about another kind of awareness, awareness of something else, awareness of your own mental states. And this is sometimes referred to as access consciousness, because you, as it were, you as a, as a sort of unified agent have access to this bit of you, bit of your own mind that previously you didn't have access to. And you, the the um, sort of characteristic way that you can um, show that you have access to it is by being able to report it and tell someone else. You know. And there might be cases where someone else can uh, tell you, can alert you to the fact that you have a mental state that you hadn't access to yourself. So I might say, you know, you really, you're really afraid of those things, or you really, you really, you, you really like that person, or you're, 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 you know, you're in love with that person, but you haven't recognized it yourself, you haven't access to it. And that, too, is not, that's not the thing that really raises the deep problem of consciousness. That's, you could talk about, you could have, make a similar sort of distinction, I suppose, for uh, uh, an artificial mind, for a robot. The robot has sensors that gather information about the world processes the information from these sensors, uses it to guide its behavior. Um, it maybe has plans and goals and all sorts of things that we've, that it's, some that we've programmed in, some that it's developed for itself. And you might ask, it might have a certain amount of awareness of its own processes, that, uh, its own mental processes, aware of its own goals. Some of them might, it might be available for it to reflect on and report to you. Others might be sort of programmed in at a sort of deeper level and it doesn't have any awareness of them. These are kind of engineering issues, whether you have access to something. We still haven't got to the thing that's the real, the uh, heart of the matter. So okay, but, but, kind of but, but, the, but then let me just interrupt you there, since you referred to the fact that we haven't got to the heart of the matter. <laughs> so le let me just ask you this. So, uh, okay, I, I will put it this way. I, I think that it was David Chalmers who coined the term the hard problem of consciousness, or the phrase in this case. Yes. And he was referring to the fact that, I guess, that on the one hand, we have the soft problem of consciousness that is related to the fact of us being able to uh, correlate certain states of brain activity with certain properties of consciousness or with someone being conscious or not of certain internal states or certain things uh, outside uh, or even being conscious of uh, certain types of information that the brain is processing, but basically uh, states of brain activity that are correlated with consciousness. But the hard problem would be then how we get from uh, that brain activity to uh, what we could call phenomenological consciousness, right? That, right. That, that, that is how we get from that activity to the experience we have of that's, consciousness. Correct? That's right. This, this, what's called phenomenal consciousness. That's the thing that is the that generates or supposedly generates the hard problem. And that's different from this idea of access consciousness. Access consciousness is not too difficult to get a grip on. The, we, 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 there's a different sorts of um, access relations between different systems in the brain. And, you know, we, we don't have, there's not so much of a puzzle about thinking about how the brain could be, have access to certain information or certain parts of the brain could have access to some information. Say the language center could have, have access to certain bits of memory and not to others and so on. That's not too problematic. Phenomenal consciousness, that's the thing that causes it. What is it? <laughs> what is it? Well, it's the way that we 
we get into thinking about phenomenal consciousness is something like this. We say, okay, take a case where you're aware of something. You're, I mean, let's, let's actually just start with a few examples. You just focus on something you can see at the moment um, or something you can, that you can hear in the background. Or perhaps there's some, some scent in the air or something you can feel in front of you. Just think of these things and pay attention to, to, the, to what it's like. <laughs> now, what's happening there? Well, these, uh, let, let's call these conscious experiences, okay? These are examples of conscious experience. Now, what's going off? Well, one thing that's going off is that you're picking up in your sensor, your sensory apparatus is picking up information about the world, about the colors and shapes and positions of things in the world, about the texture of the of the surface in front of you, about the uh, vibrations in the air. You're getting this information. That information is being processed in all sorts of uh, complex ways to extract um, uh, useful information about the world from it, build up a picture of the world, if you like. Um, and a lot of that information is, is being widely shared among brain systems. It's available for me to report it to you. I can say what I can say. I can tell you what I can say. And all that is in described in sort of broadly functional terms, in the kind of processes that are going on in the brain, information processing activities of the brain. And it's the sort of thing we could fairly easily, yeah, fairly easily it's, there's no great difficulty in imagining how we could get a robot to have those sorts of systems, have sensors, to have um, yeah, sort of uh, uh, information processing systems dedicated for each sense to, 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 to process the, the raw signals and extract information from them and then to integrate that and so on. But something else seems to be going on when you have these. It's something it's like. This is the way it's, it's something it's like to see whatever you can see in front of you. I can see a, a board there with some those things pinned to it. There's something it's like to feel the surface. There's something it's like to hear um, the, the rain outside or whatever it might be. It's got a kind of intrinsic feel to it. To these, to these. We're not just getting information. There's something that it's like to get that information. And now it's much less clear that uh, what to say about the robot. The robot might be getting all the same information, be sensitive to all the same features of the world that we are sensitive, might be able to report the presence of them, might be able to say, look, yes, it's raining and this surface is quite smooth, but there are also little rough bits at the edges. There are some uh, colored patches over there that look like this and so on. It could do all that, but would it actually be like anything for the robot to have those experiences? Would seeing red be like anything for it? And if it was, would it be like what it's like for us? Would red things sort of feel visually the same way to it that they do to us. If, I mean, it, we could also talk about the bodily senses. We can detect damage to our own bodies and react appropriately. Uh, but the thought is, we don't just detect the damage and react to it. We also feels like something that hurts. Okay. Um, and again, the robot might have very, very um, sensitive systems for detecting damage and responding. It might display all kinds of signs of pain, you might say. That hurts. That would be stop. I want it to stop. But does it really hurt inside? Okay. Now, when we're starting to talk about these, these inner, the inner quality of the experience, this is what we mean by phenomenal consciousness. And now, this this immediately puts us into a frame of mind where we get very puzzled because we can ask: When you and I look at, say, a, a, a ripe tomato. Uh, uh, worldly properties. It's reflecting light of a certain wavelength, let us say. It's a bit more complicated than that. And we're, uh, and we're both accustomed to calling that property red. Let us see, it's red. We both all agree that it's red, and we're, we're latching onto the same property. But is redness, is the experience of redness the same for both of us? Maybe for you, it's like what greenness is for me. I don't know. It's private. That's the problem. It's essentially private. You can detect the other kinds of things. You can detect whether I, ha I have access to certain information by asking me questions. You can't work out what it feels like for me internally, privately. You can't tell whether the robot even has any of these things. This is the problem of phenomenal consciousness. How do those processes in the brain or processes in an artificial brain generate this it's often, it's sometimes, various words are used for this. Phenomenal properties, the properties of experience, what it's like, the what it's, the what it's likeness 
of experience. Um, a term that's not used so much now is often regarded as being heavily laden with theoretical um, uh, 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 connotations is qualia, qualia, but, but, but the, the what, again, it's from the Latin qualis, what, it's, what is like, um, subjective character, raw feel, all these terms. And this is what generates the hard problem, supposedly, this is what generates the hard problem, how and when does the brain produce these things? Mm -hmm. um, okay, and, so, so oh. you refer there at a certain point to a caller, and I think that uh, that that gives us a good segue to um, introducing the concept of illusionism here, because uh, I, I mean you talked about how perhaps uh, the experience I have of red is different than the experience of you have of red or any other color whatsoever. But I, I mean, uh, in this case, it is not simply that perhaps I might be mistaken and you not. It, it is also that when we analyze the world at the, f at the level of physics, there's nothing there really that corresponds to color. It's, I, I mean, it's just different wavelengths of of photons and photons by vi vibrating uh, in different ways and things like that and heating our eyes and our uh, uh, retinas and being processed by our brains in ways that uh, evolve to be adaptive to us but don't really represent the world as it is and we can talk about colors and I mean any other thing even, even forms uh, and also other perhaps uh, higher processes like emotions and things like that I, I, I mean uh, is, is there where we move on to uh, the proposal coming from illusionism that perhaps what we experience consciously does not really correspond to what's happening in the world let's say yes that's that's that's, that's kind of it um the view that i call illusionism it's 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 not a new view it's been around for some time really from the early materialist theorists of the 19 50s were, I think, illusionists, and certainly it's had one very um, uh, uh, prominent and powerful defender, um, namely Daniel Dennett. And I see my work as very much inspired by by what he does, and um, as following in his footsteps. Now, um, he wrote a paper in the. Uh, late 80s called quining qualia mm -hmm. um, quine, to quine in, it's, it's a sort of philosopher's joke but it means to deny something whose existence it seems to be uh, completely obvious and what he did was he took this notion of, of, of qualia and looked at things people often said about qualia that uh, ineffable, you can't, can't describe them if we want to compare our experiences it's how do you describe what redness is like I mean, you can say, it's, you know, it's, tomatoes cause it. Well, yes, we know that. We're good about that. But does it cause the same thing in you as in me? How do we get any grip on this? And it's, uh, what else is it supposed to be? Um, uh, intrinsic. It's a kind of feature of the state in itself. You, you can't get any grip on it by its relations to other things. It's not that it represents something. It's it, uh, out there. It's, it's not just the representation of this worldly property, whatever the reflectance property. It's some sort of intrinsic to the state itself, to the, to, to the, to the, to the experience itself. It's um, a private, absolutely private. You know, you could, and not just in the sense that it's somehow buried away in my head, you could, your brain surgeon could explore my, 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 my brain in the utmost detail, but would never ever encounter qualia. Um, it doesn't really seem to, I mean, it's also supposed to be directly known. We're supposed to be aware of these things in a kind of immediate way. There's no possibility of of being wrong about them because they're just there presented to us revealed to us as it were the redness is not it's not it's not that i say well it, you know this experience it has this kind of red character but i could be wrong about that maybe it's green but I, you know it's 
it's the immediate feel of experience. And they just, uh, the, the problem with these things is that they just don't seem to have any place in the physical world as we know it. Um, uh, if, if, uh, if you didn't have them yourself, you would never suspect that anyone else had them. You've not, you wouldn't find any evidence of them. Uh, from exploring other people's behavior what they're doing and so what Dennett did with this notion is he kind of took it apart a bit and used a series of thought experiments or intuition pumps to show that really it doesn't it, it kind of it, it, it breaks down it's it, it what it supposes that there's some kind of sort of like I mean, he's that one he develops this idea in later papers uh, that there's some sort of headquarters in the brain, as it were, where all the information that's coming from this is kind of presented to you, mm -hmm. to, 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 to the sort of the real, the real you, who is kind of inside your brain, as it were, and gets the, and is presented with this stuff. And then you react to it. So you get presented with the pain or the redness, and then you react to it. And it's kind of in there. And it's at that, and it, there's, there's some sort of central point in the brain, a point in time and a point in space. And that's kind of presupposed by this way of talk, a way of talking about quality as being immediately presented, for example, as being private. And he took this, he, he, I mean, I, I won't try to go through the paper, but I, I certainly encourage everyone to read it. And he showed really that it is, uh, it, I, I was going to say incoherent, that it doesn't really fit together, the concept doesn't, you can't, but certainly that it's not really doing any useful work for us. We can't, there's no way of identifying uh, that there'll be certain questions we can ask about qualia, whether qualia have changed in certain circumstances, for instance, which cannot be answered either by neuroscience, obviously, or by the subject themselves. Uh, um, have my qualia changed or is it just my memory of the qualia that have changed? They, they, they become, the more we try to think about it, the more mysterious and elusive this thing becomes. And so his idea was that this notion is really doing no explanatory work for it. It's got, it simply takes us down a dead end where we are confronted with questions we can't answer. And the best thing to do is simply to drop it. It's not helping us. It's a way of misconceiving what's going on. Uh, and in response to his, and, and uh, so the, the name that he gives to this inner arena that I talked about, the central, the Cartesian theater. And the idea is that they can't, but there really was a central headquarters in the brain in the, um, pineal gland, and that was the sort of the kind of relay station to the soul, and so all the information from the senses was relayed to the pineal gland, and then it kind of broadcast this information to the soul, the immaterial soul, wherever that's located, and the soul similarly broadcast its commands back to the, the pineal gland. And, and he, Dennett's idea is that I've got the modern, the most modern philosophers of mind psychologists have given up the idea of a soul, but they still tend to have this picture of there being some sort of central locus of, of, of awareness and control. That's where we experience the qualia and where, so, where we issue our commands, issue our, uh, ex, uh, 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 exercise our free will. And this picture is, it's inconsistent. It, it generates a load of, 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 of unanswerable questions. It's completely inconsistent with what we know about how the brain is organized. There is no headquarters. There is no central. So we just need to rethink. And his whole um, project really has been to get people to rethink consciousness, to think themselves out of this very intuitive and compelling way of thinking about consciousness. And of course, then he, uh, in 1991, he wrote a long, published a long, 91, 92, I can't remember, uh, a long uh, book, Consciousness Explained, with a provocative title. Um, uh, but intentionally provocative, I think, um, in which really he invites us to read, to, he explains why this way of thinking of consciousness is so unhelpful, and then invites us to rethink it. And the upshot of this is the, 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 the sort of view that, that I've labeled illusion is when Dennett talks about consciousness and illusion. It's the idea that when we try to think about our own minds, try to introspect and form uh, and report what it's like for us, we come out with this kind of stuff, the sort of stuff that about phenomenal consciousness and about the feel of experience, but this is a sort of illusion. Um, it's not really like that. It's a kind of tale we tell about ourselves, a bit like the tale we tell about us having a self 
as some sort of persisting thing that can persist throughout our lives and that is kind of in control of everything that's the same. So it's a kind of story we tell, a kind of narrative we tell that makes sense of the kind of things we're sensitive to about our own minds, but isn't uh, and, and corresponds in interesting ways to what is actually happening in our brains, but not, it doesn't reveal reality, to, internal reality to us in the way that we kind of take it to. Um, so what is really going on when you're confronted with, um, say, a, a, a tomato or something, is that your senses are being uh, uh, bombarded with all kinds of stimuli that's so being processed. There's a whole host of reactions to these, to these stimuli. Uh, if, if you, um, you know, if you're hungry and you like tomatoes, you, you, it might make you, you know, want to, to want to grab it and eat it. If you have bad memories of tomatoes, if you're parents made you eat tomatoes and you hated them, it's going to have all kinds of associations. You might think of, I don't know, like of summer, you might think of all kinds of, a, a huge array of sensitivities are activated when you are confronted with a tomato or anything. And this, this, all this complexity, we're not aware of all its detail. But we kind of say, oh, that's what it's like. And we sum it up in this, it has this feel. There isn't this simple, ineffable feel. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of complex, uh, perfectly effable detail that we don't have proper access to. And it's, as it, as it, it's a sort of the way, uh, the metaphor, done, maybe I should, um, uh, I, I, I should, I don't want to run ahead too much, but the metaphor Dan, uh, uh, Dennett likes to use is of the user interface on a computer. Um, that, that you're, computer, um, um, the desktop of your computer, the graphical user interface. It has icons, uh, wastebasket files, directories, and you can perform operations like this by moving these things around. Now, these things do correspond to states and processes within the computer. Uh, when you delete a file, something happens on the hard disk. But it's nothing really like something being put in a bin. It's about ones and zeros being deleted. But of course, to operate at that level, at the level of, of uh, even at a um, even at the level, say, of of, of MS DOS or of machine code, it's much too complicated for most people to do. So we have this little icon and we drag it across, and that we understand that. But there isn't really a waste bin in there. What it's doing is executing a lot more a lot of more complex commands uh, that we don't really need to know about. And the idea is something like that is uh, the consciousness is something like that. It's a sort of user interface in our own brains. And so these constructs that we talk about, mm -hmm. the feel of experience and so on, or free will maybe, these are like ways of understanding and manipulating ourselves that are good enough for everyday purposes. But they are sort of like metaphors, fictions, caricatures, vast oversimplifications of what is really going on there. And that's why they don't show up at the level of neuroscience. The things that do show up at the level of neuroscience are the things we're kind of gesturing at when we talk about this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so perhaps I should I should I should uh, let you come back on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th there's a lot there to unpack, <laughs> I guess. But I, I mean, just to make this point clear, because I guess that for many people, uh, illusionism is something th they are getting in touch with for the first time here, I guess. So uh, illusionism doesn't really mean that consciousness doesn't exist. It's just that what we experience at the conscious level does not have a one-to-one -one correspondence with something that really happens in the world or in our brains. Is that correct? This, we need to be really careful here how we express this because there are ways of expressing illusionism that make it sound, as Galen Strawson has called it, the silliest thing that anyone has ever said. Um, and maybe I do want to say something, I'm not, I do want to say that phenomenal consciousness, in the sense that we introduced it as something over and above all the 
uh, information processing activity and the reactions and the dispositions and all the kind of stuff that cognitive science can get to grip with, grips with. I don't say that. I do want to say that phenomenal consciousness, as something distinct from all of that, extra, over and above all of that, does not exist. Okay. So I do want to say that, and I want to say it really quite firmly, because I think that once you start temporizing about this, then you 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 just you just let back in all the old problems. You've got to shut the door quite firmly on that. And so, and that, to many people, does seem like the silliest thing that anyone has ever said, because, ah, it's all there, it's here now. And I, <laughs> I don't think I'm my sort of, uh, the, as my, the, my mental life is any different from the people who believe, people such as, as, as Galen Strawson or, any other realists. I don't think my mental life is any different. I can understand why they want to say these things, that it's there, you know, the, 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 the feel, the sound, the, it's there and it's like something and it's vivid and it's real and it's, and it's more certain, it's known to us more certainly than anything we might know about the brain. Everything else could be an illusion. It could be that the brain, or, 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 the, the external world, could be, as, as Descartes thought, the external world could be, an, could be an illusion. My body could be an illusion. I could be some sort of... Um, uh, I could be a, a brain in a vat, I could be a simulation in a computer. The one thing that I can't doubt away is the immediate quality of my experience. The fact that I can see something blue just there, that, not that I can see, that I'm experiencing, that I'm having a blue sensation from that, that seems to be of something out there. This is the, the bedrock of our experience, the bedrock of our knowledge, the thing that we know that could not possibly be in it. So it seems that I'm saying, and in fact, <laughs> I am saying, I think, that the thing that that, that is widely, the, the one thing that is widely regarded as, the, the one thing that could not be an illusion, according to the common sense way of thinking, I'm saying is an illusion. And I do, by putting it in this uncompromising way, I'm making it hard for people to agree with me. I'm going to alienate people, people are going to say, no, come on. And, I know people who take a very similar view to me and say, don't express it that way. <laughs> don't put it like that. Say consciousness exists, phenomenal consciousness exists, but it's not what you thought it was. You know, you could just say that, you know, it's, yes, it's real, but it's not what you thought it was. As far as phenomenal consciousness, go, not the other sorts that I talked about, access consciousness, consciousness in the everyday sense. Yes, I'm having conscious experiences, whatever they are. Uh, but as far as phenomenal consciousness goes, I want to be uncompromising and say that doesn't exist. That's a, now, um, because it's only by facing up to that and trying to do the reimagining that's necessary to make sense of how we how how we are, you know, to make sense of what's going off right now, as it were, and what's going on. The only to do that is to get is to try and do without that notion, because it's a kind of crutch. And as long as you allow it in there, it's going to take all, you're going to lean on it, and it's going to do a lot of the work, and you're going to immediately have all of these problems. You've got to try to do without it. Um, it's um, so I am being uncompromising, I am being probably alienating people. I am being uh, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, hardcore on this, but that's a deliberate choice. Uh, so I'm happy to say that look, we call these, 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 these events that I mentioned earlier, when you pay attention to the, the, the color of something, to the feel of something, to the sound. When you, let's call those conscious experiences. Okay, They're ju that's just whatever's going off there. Whatever's happening when, when, I, when I'm paying attention that way to that, then I would say that conscious experiences in that neutral sense don't involve phenomenal consciousness, don't involve this inner, uh, uh, seemingly ineffable, intrinsic, uh, what it is, likeness. And we can explain everything we want to say about them without using that notion.